the world has now invested almost five trillion dollars in alternative energies in 40 years. And as a consequence of growing markets, we have reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% all the way down to 81%. Welcome back to week two of Crash or Boom, where Real Vision investigates what's happening in what may be an inflection point in markets with some of the biggest names in finance. I'm Ash Bennington. Today, Rick Rule interviews Tracy Shukart. Let me set up the context for you today. Uh, as I said, this is week two of Crash or Boom. Uh, this has been an incredible journey for us. I had a conversation yesterday, you've probably already seen it, uh, with Harris Kupperman and Louis Gobb, where we talked about volatility uh, in markets returning, a secular energy crunch, secular growth in EMs, X China, and some cyclical bull markets. Also, the risks of de dollarization in the guest view with attendant risks to US Treasury markets and the potential buoying of hard asset prices, all of which fits perfectly perfectly with our next conversation about macro energy and industrial material. With that said, I'm going to turn this one over to Rick Rule so he can kick off the interview with Chase Shukar. Two quick notes. I'm going to be hanging out in the background and I'll be back with some of your questions at the conclusion of this final production note. We're having some minor technical difficulties with the live chat on today's stream. So please drop your questions for Tracy and Rick into the comments so we can get them to them uh, as soon as possible. With all that said, Rick, over to you. Ash, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm delighted uh, to uh, participate uh, in this interview with Tracy Shukart. We're going to try and do a couple of things today. We are going to talk about natural resource markets and precious metals markets too, in the context of the economic circumstance that we face and in the context of these series. So the first part of the interview will be sort of general, talking about geopolitics and economics and markets in general. That will be followed up by a discussion of minerals, uh, both precious metals uh, and industrial materials. And finally, a discussion of uh, energy, uh, energy hopefully in all forms. That's a lot to get done in 40 minutes. So Tracy, let's get to it. Uh, there's been a lot in the news lately, and I've received a lot of inbound communication from people that I communicate with uh, about uh, what many people continue, pardon me, what many people suggest uh, are surprisingly strong inflation numbers. Uh, I, I myself am question. I question the CPI as a valid cost of living statistic, but that doesn't matter. It's what other people use. So, talk to us in the context of resource markets and uh, markets in general about stronger than in than expected inflation and any impact that you see that having in public or private markets. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think to be honest, the Fed's two percent. Uh, stated goal is probably not going to happen. And at some point, they're going to have to accept three or four percent. Now, obviously, uh, the Fed looks at core inflation, which doesn't include anything you actually need, right? So like uh, energy and food. So um, but when we, you know, look at those markets, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're looking at higher for longer. And that's just the way it is, you know, we are kind of out of this 40 year period of abundance and hitting an era of scarcity with higher rates right now. And that's going to affect every sector, um, specifically natural resources, right? And if, if we just look at energy alone, really, you can't do anything without energy. You can't grow food, you can't live, you can't move anything. You, so um, I think that you, it, we're going to be, again, in this period where we're going to have higher inflation and the Fed's either going to raise rates to ridiculous heights <laughs> and break something in the economy, um, or they're going to have to, again, uh, look at accepting higher higher inflation rates. Well, let's go into the inflation rates a little bit. I'm no economist, by the way. I'm a, I'm a credit analyst, so I always ask <laughs> questions about inflation. Uh, two things that occur to me. Uh, this reminds me uh, a bit uh, of the period of time in the middle 70s where you had had price inflation, but you hadn't had wage inflation. Uh, and I remember very well, <laughs> I'm enough older than you that I remember it firsthand as opposed to from books. 
what happened when there was a round of wage settlements in the middle part of the decade of the 70s? We look now uh, as an example at the impasse uh, around the auto workers union. Are you uh, anticipating wage inflation uh, as a consequence of the price inflation that we've seen in the last three years? Oh, I think that's ultimately what's going to happen. Again, I'm not an economist either, but I think that is what is going to happen. We're going to see that because, you know, what we really had, if we're looking at, especially in the era uh, after COVID, we had a large portion of the population, the boomers, right, leave the workforce and they never came back, right? And so this is why we're also seeing, you know, lower lower unemployment rates and you have you know what two to one or three to one job openings uh per person to be hired and i think you know to capture these workers we're just going to uh have to pay people more and and within that it's just a giant spiral right it's where the cost of living is the more you know unions are gonna ask for more money and so, and, and that just feeds off of each other. Uh, Tracy, in light of that, uh, I think you're saying that you expect inflation to be higher for longer than many commentators do. Do you think that the policy response to that, uh, and I'm asking this question both in terms of U.S. markets, but also international markets, do you think the consequence of higher inflation or one consequence of higher inflation will be higher official sector interest rates? Do you think in particular that our Fed and other Feds will allow or will force rates higher to deal with inflation? Well, you know, I, that well, that's what Powell said he's going to do, right? And this is, it's all about his legacy at this point. And um, I think, you know, he, the market keeps expecting some sort of rate cuts. You know, first people were thought we were going to have some rate cuts at the Q4 of this year. Now they're looking at, you know, next year into 2024. Yet this whole time, Powell has been extremely hawkish, even when he has paused. But again, you know, I, and I think in my personal opinion, I think they've raised too fast, too much, too fast. And that really hasn't filtered down to the real economy yet. And so um, like the Fed that tends to be reactionary. <laughs> um, I think, you know, what will happen is they'll probably raise rates till something breaks and then they'll have to, you know, flip the train. And getting away from the Fed to the rest of the world, do you expect central banks in other countries uh, to either have to or get to raise rates uh, in response perhaps to a stronger U.S. dollar or in reaction to their own inflation. Do you see this uh, high inflation, high interest rate environment being a global circumstance? Yeah, I think that th that is going to happen, especially with a stronger dollar. And we are seeing that in emerging markets. If you look at, well, Argentina or uh, Turkey, for example, where their you know, interest rates are skyrocketing just to try and con control their currency, right? Um, and so uh, stronger the dollar, you know, we're, we're uh, the stronger dollar by that fact, you know, I think Yellen's allowing a stronger dollar to sort of mitigate higher inflation rates in the United States, right? And so um, by that, we're kind of exporting inflation elsewhere. So the circumstance that you describe feels distressingly like the circumstance of the 70s, uh, described then as stagflation, where uh, high inflation forced higher interest rates and higher interest rates forced uh, economic stagnation. The trillion dollar question, uh, I guess, around natural resources is, will the consequence of a slowing economy and higher interest rates and inflation lead to a recession, uh, a US recession? You said yourself that they'll raise interest rates until they break something. Does breaking something to you mean that we face a recession? And if there's a recession, will it be a global recession? And I realize that you have no crystal ball, uh, but assuming, uh, assuming uh, some forecasting skill, how deep and how enduring would you suggest a recession might be if we have one? Well, you know, I do think that we will probably have uh, a recession. I mean, we have an inverted yield curve, which is generally 
uh, indicative of a recession. So the market's telling us we're going to have a recession. Um, now, everybody's divided on, you know, is that going to be a no landing, a soft landing, or a hard landing, <laughs> right? So either no recession, kind of a recession, or a really bad recession. And I uh, I think that all depends. I mean, I don't really have a crystal ball, but I think that that's coming. And the problem here is going to be where you have energy prices are going to remain high, even though we're in a recession. And that's where you get your stagflationary environment. Did that in the 70s. I remember it. Let's move on to more bad news just for fun. We'll make people sick before we make them well. <laughs> uh, I have noticed, uh, and maybe you have, but I'd like you to comment on it, that uh, as you said at the beginning of the interview, we've come out of a period, a very benign 40-year period. I would suggest the most benign market conditions probably in human history. And uh, uh, that had a lot to do with declining interest rates, but it also had to do with the liberalization of global trade. Uh, do you see uh, more economic nationalism? Absolutely. Uh, Go ahead. Go Sorry. ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we're already starting to see this, particularly in the agriculture sector right now. You just had India um, restrict imports of rice. You've seen this from several African nations. So we're already seeing that kind of happening with food uh, and uh, a little bit in some of some of the minerals. And so I think that this is I, I think this era of globalization is coming to an end. I think we're obviously seeing a lot of uh, geopolitical issues uh, come up as far as, uh, you know, a lot of wars, uncertainty <laughs> around uh, geopolitics right now. And so I think that, you know, when you have this era of scarcity, particularly for natural resources um, that have been severely underfunded for, you know, the last at least seven years, um, that you're going to see more nationalism and you're going to see more countries focusing on energy security and, uh, you know, supply security. Hey, sorry to interrupt again. Uh, it's Raul here from Real Vision. I'd love for you to subscribe to the channel, get the notifications. We have so many incredible conversations with so many amazing people. It will really help you in your financial journey and your journey to understand just what the hell's going on in this world. Anyway, click subscribe, get the notifications and enjoy. And let's do one more general thing around resources before we get into resources in particular. There's been a lot of discussion of a quote, BRICS currency, <laughs> the idea that, uh, the allegedly non-aligned countries in the world, I, I think it's difficult to call Russia and China non-aligned, but that's a different story. Uh, the allegedly non-aligned economies in the world forming a trade block outside the G7 or, or the G20, uh, and perhaps uh, having either a currency or a settlement system that's non-US dollar based. Uh, do you have any comments on the evolution of the BRICS currency, either as a currency or as a settlement mechanism? And what impact that might have uh, on Western economies and also commodity prices? Well, I, I think certainly we're probably not going to see that in the next three to five years, perhaps towards the end of the decade. That could happen, you know, where we see more trade in local currencies. Um, but then you kind of have to look at what they're invoiced in. So right now, 90% of the world's natural resources are invoiced in US dollar, even if they are paid in other currencies. And so that's what kind of really matters at this point. So again, I think that, and again, I don't have a crystal ball and I know that there are a lot of death to the dollar people out there, <laughs> but it, just realistically, I don't, I don't at least see this happening for another three to five years where it would actually make a difference and really want to watch kind of that invoicing. But certainly uh, it makes sense for countries to kind of want to move away from the dollar. The problem is the logistics of actually doing that right? Because it's really about the euro dollar system. And uh, that's trillions and trillions of dollars that, you know, kind of off the books <laughs> that are traded in, in dollars globally. And so um, as much as I know that a lot of people would like to see 
de-dollarization. I just don't think it's realistic, at least in the near future. In the near future, I'm not saying that can't change over time, uh, but I wouldn't expect that to happen. You know. So I think we've got the assumptions part done. <laughs> uh, we understand a bit about your worldview, which will make the specific questions about various commodities. It'll give them context. Let's move to energy. And I want to start the discussion uh, with a factoid, uh, which is to say that there's a lot of discussion about the electrification of the world the moving away from fossil fuels uh, and all that stuff. And I'm not personally going to express an opinion as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I will note for the conversation, Tracy, uh, that the world has now invested almost $5 trillion in alternative energies in 40 years. And as a consequence of growing markets, we have reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% all the way down to 81%. Uh, so I think we need to frame the energy discussion in that context. Let's start, let's start with conventional energy, oil and gas. The big thinkers of the world, the Angela Merkels, uh, the Joe Bidens, the Justin Trudeaus, that noted energy physicist, uh, what's her name, Greta Thornburg, uh, have told us that we will experience the uh, peak oil demand in 2030 or 2032 and that the terminal value of oil assets after that uh, will decline very rapidly. Do you share that point of view? Do you see us experiencing peak oil in the near term or not? And what are, from your point of view, the investment consequences of that around oil and gas? Uh, well, A, not even close. <laughs> That's peak, oil, uh, peak demand is not gonna happen by 2030. Not even I, I, in the least bit. Uh, because if you look at it, specifically, it was EIA that just came out and said this in their report. And you have to realize they're a little bit compromised um, because of the alliances that they've had after the Paris Accord and uh, with the WEF in 2016. So they uh, their reports have changed and they are pushing a narrative, but it's not realistic. So this last EIA report, basically what they said is we expect oil demand growth to be around 3 million barrels a day out to 2030, and then that, that's it. We're, we're declining after that. But that's of the assumption, if you look at the last you know, 40 years, <laughs> oil demand's been growing, especially lately, of 6 million barrels a year. And so to automatically assume to automatically cut that in half, it's just not even a realistic when you're looking at what the historical norm has been for oil demand growth. You know, and it's we may see some decline in the West, right? But that's like a billion people, about the other seven billion people <laughs> on the planet, right? You have a lot of emerging markets that are just coming up that can't leapfrog technology. Right, You're go you want to push them from gold, uh, from coal, for instance, to natural gas. Um, you, they're not just going to go from coal to wind, unless you're Germany, and then you do that, go from nuclear to coal. But um, that's that's another that's another subject. But so I think that realistically, that's not going to happen. You know, we have a lot of people in poverty. We have 600 million people in Africa alone don't have electricity at all. Um, and so, you know, that's a lot of fossil fuel demand that's going to be needed. And then, not even, and forget just emerging markets. If the West wants all these new green technologies, those require a lot of fossil fuels. Mining is very energy intensive. It requires a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, electricity, how are you gonna get electricity, right? Well, mostly natural gas, fossil fuels, again. So I think that if you wanna dig all these materials up to build all these uh, you know, windmills, again, and you know, putting these windmills together takes a lot of energy. And so it's just not realistic to think at any stretch of the imagination, are we going to see a 2030 uh, peak oil demand at, at all? Uh, <clears throat> a supporting statistic, you got <clears throat> most of it, right. Um, 600 million people in Africa with access to primary electricity, but almost a billion people worldwide. 
than 2 billion people worldwide with access only to intermittent or unaffordable uh, elect electrical energy. A different statistic that I want you to talk about, uh, Wood Mackenzie, Hart Publications and others have suggested that the global oil and gas industry is under investing in sustaining capital and new project investment to the extent of about a billion dollars a day, 360, 365 billion dollars a year. What do you see as a consequence of this lack of sustaining capital investment in terms of the oil industry's ability to maintain current production two years out or three years out? Do you see uh, enough reinvestment to maintain supplies, enough new project investment to maintain supplies, or are you seeing a, a supply shortfall in the out years? Uh, obviously, I think we're seeing a sh supply shortfall. You know, I mean, if you look at oil and gas producers, you know, particularly for the United States, for example, now who wants to invest? You know, you have Biden saying drill, 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 but we want to phase you out by 2030. Now, who wants to invest capital <laughs> in these projects, right? If the government's also telling you we don't want you around in five, eight years. Um, so that's making it really difficult. Uh, and so I think that, and if you look around at, you know, spare capacity anywhere, I, really the only place you really have spare capacity is Saudi Arabia right now. And that's just not enough. And that's just not enough and not enough growth, even though, you know, they do plan to build out uh, their capacity to, I think, 12 million or 13 million uh, by 2027. You know, whether that's doable or not, we can is is a different story. We'll have to see how that goes. But there's just really not enough capacity in the world. And so, what we're going to be faced with again is higher for longer, the era of scarcity. Uh, a couple comments there. Uh, in North America, the investment community perhaps as a consequence of bad spending decisions in the past, perhaps not, uh, is favoring oil and gas companies that are increasing returns to shareholders, meaning diverting capital, frankly, from reinvestment and growth to current yield. It, it, putting on your investor hat as opposed to your commentator hat, would you be investing in companies that were uh, investing themselves in hopes of increasing production two or three years out or would you be investing in companies that were maintaining higher current yields, either via buybacks, dividends, or both? I think you would look for those higher yields because we all know what happened in the shale industry before. We had two busts in the shale industry in the past, right, where it was just drill, baby, drill, baby, drill. These companies went into debt. <laughs> um, and uh, obviously there were no shareholder returns at, at that point. They went through VCs, they went through uh, private equity, they went through the banks, they went through, you know, everybody tried to invest in them. And so I think that era is, I think that era is over. I think, you know, they have kind of, these companies have learned their lesson, if, if you can call it that. Um, and with the pressure of governments telling them they don't want them around, you know, they want to keep their investors right now. I mean, we went from energy being almost what, like 20% of the S&P 500 waiting to 2%, right? And I think we're around 4% right now. And so I think those companies want to keep investors. And so they're going to, you know, and investors want to see them pay down the debts. They want to see dividends. They want to see stock buybacks. They want, they want to see capital discipline. And so, you know, as an, as an investor, that's what I would be looking for in these companies. You're a pay me now gal, not a pay me later gal. Got it. <laughs> uh, the next question goes to North American natural gas. Uh, we probably need to draw a line along the 49th parallel, maybe not. Uh, it would seem that the United States, as a co consequence of byproduct gas uh, around the shale plays, uh, has a, at least a temporary surplus in terms of production. It would seem that the surplus in Canada is more political, which is to say uh, Mr. Trudeau's suggestion that there's no business case for exporting Canadian LNG. If you were allocating capital yourself now in the conventional energy space in North America, would you be more oil centric or more gas centric in light of the current overproduction of gas? Well, I think if, I think you know 
and we do have projects going on in uh, the Gulf Coast, right? So we can, um, as far as LNG is concerned, because we can export it now. And certainly if I was Canada, I would be investing in pipelines to the West Coast to move it out of Canada <laughs> um, instead of having it landlocked. So I think if I were an investment company, you know, I would be looking in uh, production and export uh, facilities for something like LNG, uh, because in light of the sanctions against Russia and uh, Europe in particular, trying to move away from Russian gas and us telling the rest of the world that they should also move away from Russian gas, uh, that, you know, we're going to need other sources for that. So am I correct then, uh, and, and please correct me if I'm not right, uh, are you suggesting that the current low prices <clears throat> in the face of increasing infrastructure for natural gas liquids export uh, heralds a revival of the North American, a revival of the North American natural gas industry? I think perhaps, well, I mean, we'll have to see. I don't, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but looking at, you know, I think we are going to see, you know, we've seen prices at this 250 level for months, and that's pretty much been the, you know, the, the range it's been trading in, aside from, you know, a couple of price spikes that we've had in the past. Um, but that's because it's mostly been landlocked. And so, you, you know, and we've even seen Waha go negative several times. Uh, natural gas because it's landlocked. They're paying you to take it. Right. <laughs> so, so I think that um, I think that if we focus on exports, I think that's a good thing for the natural gas industry. And I think there's opportunity there. Uh, let's move on a little bit. You know, as a contrarian, I uh, I like things that are out of favor, and I love things that are hated. There's very little in the energy business that's un as uh, unloved as coal. Uh, some coal producers are trading at three times EBIT with uh, 30 years, 35 years reserves and resources. And the record year globally for coal demand was, drum roll, uh, 2022. Can you talk about your own outlook for coal and whether or not the very cheap multiples on the big coal producers are justified uh, in the context of their uh, carbon generation or unjustified relative to all the people worldwide that would like primary access to electricity. Well, yeah, absolutely. I think that what we're seeing, and if you look at emerging markets, China in particular, it's you know has been over the last forty years, you know, straight up and from the left up to the right, right hand corner, right. Um, and so, and we're seeing increased uh, coal use in, say, Pac, Pac Asia. We're seeing increased coal use in uh, India. We, we're seeing increased coal use in. Germany, of all places, <laughs> again, I love to bring up Germany uh, because it's uh, an enigma. But um, so I think that, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, I don't think it's going away anytime soon either. So, I, you know, I don't, I'm kind of agnostic on it, although, you know, I do own some full stocks. <laughs> um, uh but I don't think it's going away anytime soon, I, I, you know, obviously. As much as people want to get away from it, they're not going to get away from it. And people want access and to cheap coal, right? P particularly, you know, I think Pakistan, um, because they're having problems getting natural gas because their credit is awful. Um, so they would love some, <laughs> they would love cheap coal. And so, uh, you know, I don't think, I, I think with all the emerging markets, it's certainly not a resource that's going away anytime soon, even though the West would like to think that it is. And, and let's move over from a sort of hated uh, commodity to a re really hated uh, commodity. Uh, <laughs> ironically, uh, maybe the only natural resource bull market that's ongoing, which is to say uranium. We've seen the uranium price now, the spot price, uh, escalate by almost 30% this year. Uh, do you see uh, uranium utilization continuing to increase? Uh, and if so, uh, do you think that the current production deficit in uranium uh, will lead to an increase in uranium prices? And if so, when? Um, it, yes, and yes, <laughs> the, in the short answer. Um, but yes, we, we, you know, 
if we really want to make this energy transition, particularly in the West, I know that the West has shied away from, especially particularly after Fukushima, we've seen Europe really, in particular Germany, kind of shy away from nuclear. I mean, Schultz just said, no more nuclear. Nuclear is dead. There's no base case for nuclear. But if you really want uh, clean energy, if you want this, you know, zero carbon energy, you're going to have to look at, <laughs> you're just going to have to look at nuclear uh, power. And so I think that, you know, we're seeing a lot of projects, particularly in Asia right now that are in the pipeline um, that are being completed. So that demand is going to go up, right? Certainly their energy demand is not going away anytime soon. I think with these um, SMR, small modulator reactors, modular reactors. I think that technology is very interesting. I think that that it, it it's uh, it, the pipeline is smaller to to build these. Um, the cost is smaller, and the lead time to build these projects is is shorter. And so I think that will be. I think that would be. I think the West, particularly in North America is going to gravitate towards that technology. So really all I see is demand for uranium going up. And the problem is, is that we don't have enough uranium either. And these projects take a very long time. Uh, you know, the US has basically shut down all of their uranium and was buying from Russia. You know, and just to start say in, particularly in Europe and the United States, if you just look alone at the permitting process, right? So you've got like 10 years just to get a permit. Then you've got to dig the hole. Then you've got to get it out of the ground. And then you got to, so when you're looking at these times and there's nothing really in the pipeline right now. So if you're looking at these lead times, you know, you're looking at 10, 15, 20 years sometimes uh, to get these projects really off the ground and, uh, producing commercially viable uh, minerals. And so I think what is going to happen is we're going to also have a shortage of uranium. And so I think, we're, again, those prices are probably uh, expected to stay, again, higher for longer. And I know uranium over the years has been a kind of a precarious trade. There's been, it's like been boom or bust for uranium, uh, for the uranium trade, but again, I think that we are looking in an era if we're getting serious about uh, green technologies, we had to have to have nuclear in the mix. And with that, you need <clears throat> uranium. You pointed out that uh, American production of uranium is functionally nil. Uh, ironically, uh, given that we're sort of at war, uh, it's interesting that American imports of Russian enriched uranium have doubled in 12 months. Does the source of uranium matter? Is uranium fungible? Should North American investors and American investors particularly care about source? Will the Canadians continue, as an example, to export Athabasca Basin uranium around the world? And can, as an example, the United States rely on Kazakhstan, the world's largest producer of uranium? In other words, does the source matter? Well, I, 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 do you want my opinion or the That's fact? It. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think, no, the source doesn't matter. And, you know, there has been legislation up that's kind of been idled now to stop imports of Russian uranium, but we can't because there's just not enough. And that's the problem. So that legislation has been introduced, but it's gone nowhere. It's, it's been sitting idle right. for almost a year now. So let's move on from energy uh, to minerals. And I'm going to break it up between precious metals uh, and industrial materials. We're going to start with precious metals. Your economic assumptions at, at the top of the interview uh, went very much, I would suggest, towards uh, an economic slowdown uh, as a consequence, perhaps, of higher interest rates, uh, but also continuing inflation. That's the playbook that I came into business in, in the 1970s. That was a very good period for precious metals. Uh, another statistic for our audience, the market share of precious metals uh, in North America is one half of 1%, which is to say precious metals and precious metals related securities compromise one half of 1% of total savings and investment assets in the United States. 
down from a four decade mean of 2%. Is the circumstance that you described at the top of the interview, stagflation, likely, you think, uh, to cause precious metals demand, as an example, to revert to mean or go higher or not? Uh, is gold, in fact, a pet rock? Is it a relic? Talk to us about precious metals demand and precious metal supplies, if you care, in light of your discussion at the top of the interview. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know I don't think that it's a pet rock by any stretch of the imagination. You know, I think that um, heading into this sort of environment, gold is probably something you want to have in your portfolio, if not own the actual physical. Uh, because, you know, at least, you know, if, and if you're, especially if you're a big de-dollarization fan or think that we're going to hyperinflate the dollar away, <laughs> you definitely want gold at, at that point, right? Um, even if it goes nowhere, you know, it's, it's a very liquid market as far as being able to sell it. So, you know, for me, you know, I, always would like to have at least some some gold in my portfolio probably again and some actual physical holdings of gold because if you know if if it all goes to hell <laughs> at, at least you have <laughs> at least you have something right um uh, that's been around for 4000 years and uh you know is still highly traded and let's move on now to the industrial materials. Uh, uh, it, it has been noted by many people, myself included, that investment in productive capacity and exploration around a wide variety of industrial materials, but primarily, of course, copper and zinc, but extending uh, through the whole suite of invest industrial materials and in light of increasingly uh, constrained supply chains and economic nationalism, uh, that it is likely that industrial materials prices trend higher. I understand myself the underinvestment, uh, the idea that we will experience shortfalls, production shortfalls. Is it possible that an impending recession will reduce demand enough that although supply comes down, if demand comes down too, that the prices go nowhere? Uh, if that is the case, how long might that last? Or do you think, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that the impending supply shortfalls, particularly in my mind in copper, will be severe enough that the prices will move irrespective of a recession? Well, I think that they will move irrespective of a recession. Because really what we're seeing, again, we have a lot of fiscal policies going on right now that are counteracting what the central banks are doing. Right. And so because of this green push, particularly again in Europe and the United States, we're seeing a lot of fiscal policies as far as, um, you know, subsidies. They want uh, production to come home now. Uh, you know, how many mines actually open up in the U.S. and Europe is a totally different story. Um, but, you know, there is being money spent on this. And I think if they want this green push, ir irrespective, you're still going to. You need, you're still going to need energy, right? You still need to run things. <laughs> you still, still need to manufacture projects. Um, you still need to build windmills if that's what you want to build, or solar panels, et cetera. And that's you know that's a whole other story in itself. But so I think that um, at this point, demand is somewhat relatively inelastic, and where maybe you'd see you know a recession in say, the United States or Europe, I think you're going to see demand push up elsewhere, particularly emerging markets, provided that they're not completely in a depression because of what we cause. But I think, again, with all these new green projects and all this, this push, I think that um, you're really going to see demand for these metals anyway. And if you look at past recessions, even though you've seen a dip in demand in energy and metals, they really pulled, they, that demand came back far more quickly than the actual markets did. And so I think that um, using that as kind of your barometer, I would say even if we did go in a recession and if we saw a dip in demand, it would be very short-lived. 
Uh, Tracy, in light of that, do you have a favorite? Uh, are you a zinc fan, a nickel fan, a copper fan? I'm uh, I'm a huge copper fan, and I'm actually a huge uh, silver fan that I would put in that middle ground between precious metals and kind of an industrial metal, right? Because it has industrial purposes. It's particularly when we're looking at um, electric vehicles and solar panels, et cetera. So I really like silver a lot as well. Silver will generate a lot of questions from an investment audience, given the extraordinary volatility that exists. Uh, Ash, I'm uh, cognizant of our time and the way that we're supposed to be dividing up this interview. Are you ready to uh, reassert and open up? <laughs> Rick, I've uh, just found this to be a fascinating conversation. Uh, and I have just so many questions. I mean, it was just terrific listening to you guys go back and forth. Uh, the first thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about energy, uh, you know, and I know people have strong feelings about this on both sides. I want to keep it neutral and fact based here. Uh, but the reality is when I hear people talk about uh, reaching peak oil consumption in, in, I don't know, six and a half years or six and a half minutes, I've never seen anybody who's serious about the data and the facts suggesting that that seems to be a, a likely possibility. Uh, we've got a, a ban on internal combustion engines coming out of California in 2035. Uh, this is, of course, the most populous state in the United States, the largest economy. I, I guess the one thing that I was thinking about, you guys have a lot of expertise in this field. Talk a little bit about uh, what that production pipeline looks like. You know, we live in this world uh, where people think about, uh, you know, Amazon services, just turn it on and overnight delivery. That's not the way the energy space works. Uh, there are decades of permitting. These projects are uh, often very capital investment heavy, need to be financed over 20, 30 year time horizons. Uh, talk about what you see coming in terms of the production pipeline risk relative to the demand that you see coming uh, not just from the US, but uh, globally, particularly from the global south and developing emerging markets. Who are you addressing the question to? Uh, let's have Rick take I, it. <laughs> go ahead, Rick, jump in. Uh, I, uh, I used to live in the People's Republic of California. Uh, and so I watch political develops there with interest. Um, I suspect that the California voters are about to fight back. It's really easy to propose changing their life in 2035 when you're in 2023. Uh, and I suspect that when the deadline comes closer to change their lives more completely, that the California voters will ultimately thank and excuse uh, Governor Gruesome and his ilk. Uh, it's worthy to note that the governor uh, at once proposes to phase out the internal combustion engine and phase out drilling for oil and gas in California. Uh, I think that that's sort of symptomatic of the silliness that exists around the world. From my own viewpoint, having been in the energy business myself for almost 50 years, uh, I know that a circumstance where you defer sustaining capital investments right. reduces your ability to produce in the out years. Uh, yeah. And I would suspect that oil, oil supplies X a recession will be much tighter three years from now than they are today as a simple consequence of the underinvestment by the industry, including state-owned firms, of a billion dollars a day. Uh, I would point to you, I would point you to Pemex and Petavesa, the national oil companies of Mexico and Venezuela in particular, to demonstrate the impact of a lack of sustaining capital investment. Those countries have starved their domestic industries in favor, ironically, of subsidizing petroleum consumption by their populations, and as a consequence have reduced their production capabilities by up to 80%. And I think that's sort of a harbinger of what happens if you defer sustaining capital investments to the extent that they're being, you know, reduced today. Tracy, do you have any thoughts on that? No, absolutely. I mean, I completely agree. I, th those are two prime examples where you've had, you know, rather very large producers, you know, for three to four million barrels a day reduced to, you know, I think Venezuela is at 700,000 barrels a day, down from 3.5 or 3.8, the height and, uh, you know, and same with Pemex. 
you know, they're at like 1.7 million barrels a day. And so, and they have crumbling in infrastructure is the right. problem. So you, even if they wanted to produce more, they can't, they can't without billions and billions of investment. Yeah. And the, and the challenge isn't just the billions and billions of investment. It's also the time horizons. I mean, to your point, Rick, and I think it's an important one, uh, this idea of, you know, it's easy to say anything is going to be done in 2035. I mean, hell, every November, I'm convinced that I'm not going to eat bread or drink red wine come January, right? It's really easy to make promises in the future. Uh, but the challenge is when you have this disconnect between the time required to build out the infrastructure for production capacity, you can wind up with an awful mismatch. Agreed. Uh, and I, I do think that um, the popularity of the prognostications of the big thinkers, the Greta's, the Trudeau's, the Biden's, the Governor Gruesome's, uh, it has been acceptable to the people when they haven't had to pay the price, when they haven't faced the consequence. I suspect as the impact of those policies becomes clear and becomes expressed in the lifestyle of the voters, that the voters will likely thank and excuse those people. Uh, perhaps I'm too much of an optimist. Tracy? Uh, no, I, I agree, you know, and, and that's the thing is that, uh, particularly in the US where, you know, you have a president that lasts for maybe eight years and you're promising something, you know, 15 years down the line, 10 years down the line, I mean, by that time, a whole new administration could also come in and everything could change. So, you know, it sounds nice and all to say we're going to do this by 2035, but is it realistic and, you know, is it going to happen? It's, you know, that's completely up for to debate and we'll kind of see, you know, what happens as we get closer because we've already been pushing out these goals as it is. Yeah. And, you know, when ideology comes into conflict with the laws of physics, it's usually the laws of physics that win. Right. Yes. <laughs> so so let me ask you this. With all of this said and this context about where we are in terms of supply and demand, uh, talk a little bit about what you see some of the potential trajectories being uh, going forward. Uh, Rick, you already mentioned the idea uh, that we might see a shift in terms of electoral dynamics, but, but what do you think this looks like uh, in terms of uh, the production and consumption mix that we see moving forward? Well, you mentioned physics. Uh, fossil fuels are an extremely efficient form uh, of fuel for motor transportation. They deliver a lot of energy uh, relative to the volume of the material. They're just extraordinarily efficient. And I would suspect that people will continue to favor efficient forms of energy and people will continue to favor uh, an increasing lifestyle. Uh, I may be cynical, but most, most voters seemingly would like other people to sacrifice. <laughs> uh, I suspect that the political backlash that I think will happen to North America will happen other places too. Uh, the politically correct view of energy, as an example, has quintupled the energy bills of the Germans. The Germans have been able to blame the Russians, but the Germans need to understand as an example that relying on solar power where the sun doesn't shine is a, a scientifically challenged way of maintaining the German grid. And I think that we've said that voters' perceptions will change. I also think that we are gonna run headlong five years from now into the consequence of systematic underinvestment in natural resource production and energy distribution infrastructure. And I think that that will generate uh, supply shocks. Now, if that happens, markets take care of themselves. Uh, if you take up the price of energy too high too quickly, you actually do impact demand. That happens, markets work. They're really messy. My own outlook, and I was more interested in Tracy's than my own, but since you asked me, I'll give you mine. My own outlook is that we're in for a period of higher prices, but extraordinary price volatility. Mm. And I think that'll unnerve uh, consumers, producers, and poly policymakers alike. It'll amuse me. Tracy, thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree with 100% what Rick said. And if, you know, if we're looking at these technologies, um, First of all, you can't have solar and wind that are intermittent as your base load. So you're going to need something else as your base load. 
whether that's fossil fuels or nuclear. It's, that's your choice right now. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, you can't just say we want to get rid of fossil fuels or nuclear, but we don't have any other technology to fill in for it, right? right. So we're, we're, you can't leapfrog evolution, right? These technologies take time and uh, we haven't discovered them yet. <laughs> Right. And so and, and if you look at just the efficiency, I mean, we just had Germany come up and said that 15 percent of all their solar panels are in severe degradation faster than they thought. Um, and then if you look at wind, um, we're, these projects are becoming far, far, far too expensive. You just had Orsted say we're willing to walk out of the projects in Connecticut and New York. Uh, because they're going to be too expensive. We're going to have to raise your price 63% per megawatt hour, or the government's going to have to give us a lot of money, or we're going to walk away. And so these projects are not producing the returns and they're too expensive as well. Tracy, let me ask you this. Um, the broad agreement from you and Rick on kind of the long-term structural dynamics of the energy markets uh, in shorter term time horizons, meaning you know, say six to 24 months, how are you thinking about positioning yourself this? How can you play this thesis? Go ahead, Rick, go ahead. <laughs> Let Rick go. You know, I, I've, I, I've enjoyed such returns from my own oil and gas portfolio uh, and the break in the oil prices higher has really rallied oil stocks. Uh, I think if you are a 12 month speculator, you need to be cautious. Uh, you need to pay some attention to gravity. If you're an investor with a five-year perception, uh, I think it's absolutely clear sailing. My suspicion is that the oil stocks need a bit of a rest. I need to tell you though, Ash, my short-term my short-term timing track record is virtually unblemished by success. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, take what I said with a grain of salt. Uh, these are very, very good businesses. High current returns to shareholders. They've done a wonderful job paying down debt. So they're going to be able to increase dividends or they're going to be able to uh, increase reinvestment or both. In the near term, the stocks have performed so well uh, that uh, perhaps because my, ectation, my expectations were low, <laughs> that every sort of level of near term greed that I have personally has been exceeded. I'm always interested in the fundamentals, Rick. That's a great answer. Uh, Tracy, over to you. Uh, thoughts on the short term? Uh, well, Explain. sure. You know, short term, again, I, you know, I agree with Rick. Uh, uh, on the oil and gas side, I think if you look at some of these basin industrial metals that have come, you know, that have come off the highs, the 2022 highs, a lot, um, and, and, and the corresponding, say, miners, Maybe something to look at in in the short term because they have it. We haven't seen that bounce that we have in energy, and that energy prices are going to start affecting those markets. Um, and so we could see in the short term a bounce in those. But I would like to say overall in the long term, I mean, I think that the commodities super cycle is really just starting. And I think, you know, over the next decade, you're going to want to own hard assets. Yeah. Uh, one final question uh, for you both. Uh, Tracy, I was taking notes when you were talking at the beginning of the show about where you see this from a cyclical perspective. Uh, you talked about rates being higher for longer. Uh, the sense that the Fed has probably raised too far too fast, that it hasn't yet filtered down to the general economy yet. Uh, and you're belief that they're going to continue to raise until something breaks, which probably means a recession. Certainly, uh, as you point out, that's been suggested by the inverted yield curve. Uh, my question to you is, how does that intersect with some of the points that we were talking about here today on the energy, materials, and base metal front? Do you see any potential indicators of recession, to bring it back to the theme of this conversation, crash or boom? Do you see any potential indicators, Tracy? I'm going to go to you next, Rick. Uh, in terms of the cons of, of demand uh, for either energy or uh, base metals and materials. Well, again, and I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. If you look at uh, prior recessions, not you know, let's take kind of the COVID part out because that was 
a very different scenario. But if we look at the last recession, 2007-8, right, we did see a dip in demand. However, that dip was a very, very short-lived as far as, uh, you know, a natural resource was were concerned, particularly energy. So even if you do see a dip in demand, and one could argue that we are seeing a dip, you know, one could argue if you look at CPI right now globally, uh, you know, manufacturing is down, particularly in Europe, particularly in Germany, which is the manufacturing powerhouse, um, is, is in contraction. And so, but yet we're still seeing energy demand high, right? And so um, I think that regardless of a recession, demand is relatively inelastic. Mm. Rick, thoughts uh, from the perspective of energy and materials having a, a sort of a forward indicator look on broader macroeconomic perspective from a cyclical perspective. Yeah. Again, my caution is that my short-term track record, forecasting track record is unblemished by success. <laughs> uh, I would suggest that we have seen market responses in some commodities. Uh, in others, uh, we haven't. I suggest as an example, that the move in the spot uranium price from $45 a pound to $66, $67 a pound isn't over. I think it really depends on the utility of the commodity in, dis in discussion versus the current price point. You will see at numbers like $100 US in crude oil that as that price flows through to the pump or wherever you feel it, people will moderate their demand, but I really think it depends commodity to commodity. By the way, in terms of scarce commodity minus time, I have a hard stop in 30 seconds. So I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to drop off of the conversation and you're gonna to have to continue it with Tracy. Uh, I've enjoyed the opportunity, Tracy and, and Ash. Pleasure. But I do in fact need to go. Rick, uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure, thank you. Thank you. Tracy, thanks so much for joining us. I really enjoyed this one. Thanks, spectacular conversation. I hope you guys will come back and do this again soon. This was awesome. Absolutely. It's been a long time. It's good to be back. <laughs> great. And great to have you back. Uh, listen, I should say as we wrap this show, Michael Howell, one of my favorites with Andreas Steno Larson on an extended Real Vision daily briefing tomorrow at 4 p.m. I know you're not going to want to miss that. Mike Howell, one of my favorite guests for sure. Thank you again so much, Tracy, for joining us. And thank you, Rick. Have a great afternoon, everybody. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.